Pierre, you're a fabulous pianist, and you're the president of the Cleveland International Piano Competition. Thank you so much for being here sure. on Living the Classical Life. Thank We're you. so happy to have you. So the great Hungarian composer, Béla Bartók, once said that competitions are for horses. <laughs> so why are competitions so hated by so many musicians and audiences? You know, I wouldn't say all audiences hate them. <laughs> <laughs> um, Competitions, it's sort of, I've heard this many times, say it's sort of this necessary evil sometimes, you know. Um, and this, this whole metaphor of the horses, I heard someone say that um, to prepare for a competition, you know, you train like an athlete, but you have to perform like a poet. And I think it's that dichotomy which scares a lot of musicians, you know, and it's that element of sportsmanship which maybe turn off some people. Um, and yet for others, it's just extremely exciting to see that play out. Um, my own answer to that is that, you know, all of life is a competition. You know, your whole life as a musician is a competition. Um, you go to an orchestra audition, you know, a lot of them are done behind a screen, which to me seems even more brutal. Um, and you have five minutes or ten minutes to decide your fate. Um, and the result is sometimes just as mystifying or even more um, than competitions. You know, sometimes some of the best players go for orchestra auditions or, you know, it's music school auditions. You know, and if you go to a conservatory, you're playing an audition. You go to a music festival, you're playing an audition with hundreds of other pianists I don't, or musicians. I don't think that that's any different. It's a competition. Um, and so I think competitions, in a way, just crystallizes that. It's very... For those 10 or 15 days, it's just that very pure form of the art. Well, it's so fascinating because there's always this notion that classical music is so competitive, which it is, but I don't think more so than any other field. If you, no. if you think about it in the business community, absolutely, everyone's always in this ladder trying to climb to the top. But yeah. there is such a proliferation of piano competitions, well, mm -hmm. music competitions in general these days. Yeah. Is it possible that there are too many? Yes, <laughs> there for sure. <laughs> Um, I think competitions also, it, the way we see them, the way the, the whole industry sees them has changed drastically since, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, you only had a handful of competitions and they were run by people that were incredibly powerful in mm -hmm. the music industry as well. Um, and you still see that to some extent um, with the Tchaikovsky competition and Gergiev's involvement and, you know, the Clyburn, to some extent with Clyburn. Um, and I think trying to figure out, competitions have to try to figure out how they fit into the landscape now. For sure there are so many of them and um, it's sort of like, um, how should I say this, you're going to stand out as a competition in the way that you treat the contestants that arrive mm -hmm. or the way that you treat just the whole thing, the whole event. Um, for I, I was at a jury, um, and I won't say where, but I was on a jury, <laughs> and you know, I, some of the jurors um, consistently talked about um, their, this contest, contestant defeating that one. <laughs> and I thought, okay, so that's, that's probably part of the whole, the whole um, misconceptions sometimes and jurors make that mistake sometimes and um, competitions a lot of competitions are trying to figure that out um, so you know that's why I, for sure I think there are too many and um, you have to for you have to be careful because a pianist can easily think or a musician any musician can easily think that this is the only way I have to only prepare for this um, it's certainly not my life wasn't through competitions um, and I know many people who, who've done incredibly well, whose their lives is not through competitions. It's a tool. It's just a tool, um, one of many that you can use. So how, how do you explain the fact that, okay, if there are so many piano competitions, mm -hmm. 
then there are so many winners. Some of them go on to have sustainable careers, yeah. and some of them don't. Right. What's the difference? The difference is in how they approached it. Hmm. Um, and, you know, a competition is one step in your life. It's one point in your life as a musician. Um, it's not... You can't depend on winning that competition to, for everything just then to fall into place after that. It used to be like that, truly. I mean, if you... Um, with the Cleveland when it was the Casada Sioux, or if you won one of those big competitions, um, the engagements were just of such a nature um, that the rest of the world really looked to the competition to see who was winning next, and you know they had, they had a hard time figuring out the field. But now with technology, you know, YouTube, Facebook, all of these things, there is such a proliferation, and you can easily go online and look somebody up, and you know. Um, so that's why I say you, you have to, to whoever who wins, I always say to them, you have to th think of this as a tool and you have to make the transition as whoever, you know, such and such winner of the Cleveland or winner of the Clyburn, winner of the Tchaikovsky to just, you know, such and such pianist, you know, and figure that out. Um, it's just, and every person figures that out differently. Um, and that's fascinating for me to see their careers that way. Yeah. From the standpoint of the audience, mm -hmm. is it possible or do you get a sense that some of the audience members are there to see someone win something rather than going there because of the music? I wonder, do some of these audience members go on to not going to any other music concerts? Uh, you know, that was a question I had too and um, we did an audience survey at the competition in 2013. <laughs> um, and that was one of the questions is, why did you come today? Um, and one of the boxes we checked out just for the thrill of a music competition or just to see great piano music um, or a friend brought me. And overwhelming response was just to hear great music. And that gave me a lot of hope. And you know, um, I wanted to cloak the festival, uh, the music competition in this festival. Um, and that was sort of a, a validation of that, that people came for the music. And where else in this part, you know, of the region do you get 15 days of just crystallized, the greatest piano repertoire day after day played by young, exciting musicians? Um, you know, undeniably for some, there is that, some of, the, some of the competition patrons, I mean, they come day one, session one, and sit through everything. And, um, and I do see them at other concerts, um, but they, they come for the competition just to see, you know, and they develop a, a certain um, love for one of the pianists and they get so upset when the pianist doesn't advance <laughs> or they write to them or, you know, um, they keep in touch. And I think that's wonderful, you know. It's just at least the, the pianist got here, the exposure was immense. Um, we have managers, agents from all over the country come, uh, presenters from all over the country come, and a lot of the times they love one of the early round pianists and um, engage them in, in concerts. And um, so I, I like seeing that dynamic play out. So Pierre, you come from South Africa. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your musical beginnings and how your path from being a wonderful pianist brought you eventually to becoming the president of one of the most important piano competitions in the world. Yeah, well, I'm uh, South African originally and from a very tiny town in South Africa, Heidelberg, um, where my aspirations, you know, I started piano when I was 12, almost 13, and my aspirations was, it would be great if I can go to college and actually major in music and um, didn't think much beyond that. Um, and most South Africans at that point, also when they go overseas, they go to Europe. You know, Hanover, Germany was a big draw for a lot of pianists mm. at that point. Hanover has a great, and still does, still great does. piano school. Um, so, and I didn't even think about that. But day one, undergrad, freshman year, um, I met um, Sophie, who would later be my wife. And um, she was just so focused and so um, 
well trained at that point. She was, you know, light years ahead of me, and um, just such an inspiration. And she had just prepared for a big piano competition in South Africa, and um, and I could see her her aspirations. You know, she was headed overseas, like you know, that's that's where she's headed, and that really just really kick-started something in me that's such an inspiration when somebody has that drive and that ambition um, and to really make something of this make some make a life of this um, you have to have that that drive that inner fire to make this happen um, and I knew if I wanted to, you know I quickly fell in love with her and if I wanted to go along <laughs> I had to practice my butt off uh, so that's that really served as a good as a as a great inspiration and so we came to the States uh, in 2001 and ended up uh, first at Youngstown State studying with Carolina Altman's fabulous pianist, Charlie fabulous. pianist. and um, she really whipped us into shape um, that German school of discipline uh, was so good for us um, and from there we went to Cincinnati to study with Frank Weinstock at uh, the Conservatory of Music there marvelous marvelous musician and sort of the complete opposite also of Carolina in that he just very relaxed in his overall approach to the career of music to this life in music however you know studying Beethoven with him if you did one lesson on Beethoven with him it it unlocked all of Beethoven he was that kind of teacher he is that kind of teacher it was um, you know a lesson with him he would do a Beethoven uh, opus 110 and he would go into the Bach, you know, uh, passions and Bach ce a Beethoven cello sonatas. It just drew it from all over. So it was very inspiring to be with him. And to come to the States, um, which is so wildly different in culture from what I grew up in and the European mindset, the States is, of course, the land of opportunity. Right? <laughs> it's entrepreneurship galore, you know, and that really sparked an interest in me because I met many, I met uh, fellow students at TCM who were, you know, Americans and um, who said to Sufi and I, you know, you should start doing concerts. Um, and growing up in South Africa as a student, you think, well, I'm just a student. I can't, can't possibly play a concert yet. You know, it's yes. not, you're not deigned yet to do a concert. And, um, but in the States, it's very different. They said, no, 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 why? Why wait? You know, just... Just do it. Just get up there and do it and organize it. And so we did, and uh, to piano, um, and it was great. We, you know, started that way, and so one concert led to another, and um, so that really that always stuck in the in the back of my mind is that um, it's a very entrepreneurial country, and that in the states there's there's room for many different kinds of musicians. You know, from the um, Sergei Babians of this world, you know, to lounge pianists you know um, it's it's amazing that way to me and people you know making a living in certain sectors or you know opera coaching or chamber musicians or um, it, I love that about this country and um, so from there we um, from Cincinnati we ended up at Heidelberg University in Tiffin I remember going for the interview I said where are you from I said Heidelberg South Africa and they said oh well we have to give you the job, <laughs> Heidelberg. Um, no, it was it was great that first teaching experience and um, universities here, which is also very different from South Africa and um, Europe. Um, the faculty have to do a lot of recruiting. They rely on the faculty, especially small colleges, rely on the faculty to do recruiting to get students to come. So I had to all of a sudden think of other ways besides just focusing on the instrument and performing, um, other ways to grow what I'm doing. And uh, so we started a piano festival and a concerto competition, a piano recital series, all of these kinds of things to recruit students. And we grew the studio. It worked, you know. But I, I, and I found myself enjoying those aspects of the job more and more and more. Um, so when this came along, uh, the, the piano competition job, it was just, it was at the right time, you know, the right moment. And I feel everything that has happened, and I, th I think a lot of musicians would agree, is everything, or the, everybody would agree in, with a successful career, that 
it, it comes along. The opportunity comes along and you have to take all of it. It's not, you can't plan for stuff like that. I mean, it, because if I go back to 2001, when we first came to the States, um, I attended the piano competition that summer, just in the audience, and the Cleveland competition. And I remember just being so, I was hooked. It was like a drug you know, <laughs> for me. I would, and putting that into context, you know, when the, when the musicians arrive here, treating them not as contestants, but as artists, which they are. Every single one of them, and let's not kid ourselves, just getting to Cleveland, they've already won an incredible competition. I mean, with the, uh, the pre-screening process, you know, hundreds of pianists apply. And from that, all those hundreds, for those 25 uh, to get here, um, they've, it's, it's been a long journey for them already to get here, just to be selected. And so I really wanted to cloak that, that whole experience as celebratory as a festival. Um, so our opening cer ceremony used to be a very serious event, you know, where <clears throat> they would all have to come up and draw a number when they're going to play. And God forbid you draw number one, right? And nobody wants to play first. Um, for me, again, that was too much focus on um, the competitive element and that they're going to be treated like horses here. Yes. You know? um, I wanted to focus on the celebration. We are here to celebrate their artistry. We're here to celebrate the art of piano, great music, masterpieces. So um, I changed the whole idea of the opening ceremony to, you know, I invited Alexander to come back and play piano concerto. And we just introduced them to the audience uh, already in performance order. Um, this is uh, Alexander Schimpf? Alexander Schimpf, yes. yes, our 2011 yes. winner. I invited him to come back. Um, and he played a Mozart concerto uh, with Joel Smirnoff conducting City Music uh, Cleveland. And that, I think ju that just changed the face of everything. Um, being inclusive, being collaborative, um, and having it seen as a celebration. And I was backstage with every single contestant. Um, I was there and... Is that unusual for I, a piano is. competition president to be that, backstage that with is. each? I think that is. Um, I was there to you know, greet them, say hi, welcome them, and just, you know, wish them well, say, have a blast. And, you know, you're here, you're at Gartner. It's a beautiful hall, beautiful stage, appreciative audience. Um, just, you know, play for this audience who come to listen to you. Um, because I feel like the worst thing that you can do as a pianist in a, in a competition is play for the jury. Hmm. Um, because that's going to change the way you think about your own playing. You're going to say, oh my gosh, I know this professor likes Bach this way or likes Mozart in this way. And you're going to try and change things that you're doing in your preparation. And you shouldn't. Um, because that's, like I said, again, music this today, and I tell them all, today is just a point in time in your entire career. Um, you can't change who you are and what you do just because of today. Um, and it won't work, trust me. Playing to the jury won't work because okay great so you you know you please this one person on the jury but what about seven others who don't agree with what you do <laughs> <laughs> there's just no way that you can do that you have to be convincing in your own choice and it's for any concert the same way and if you have a room full of critics at Carnegie Hall are you going to play to the critics or are you just going to play to the audience to play your heart out you know so most people who go to a competition don't win Right. And, and most people who go to a competition would like to win. What do you tell the contestants who get discouraged by not winning? Mm -hmm. I, I say don't focus on that. You know, for me, it's, it's really not about who wins. I honestly don't care who wins. Um, that experience of preparing for a piano competition, you, that in itself is worth its weight in gold. Um, the kind of discipline it takes, the kind of focus it takes, um, it really prepares you. I mean, if you can muster the courage just to walk up and play two rounds after another of that intense pressure, um, you know, Carnegie will seem like a walk in the park. Um, it will seem like, oh my gosh, this is, this is so much easier than uh, playing the Cleveland competition or the Clyburn or so. It's just... Um, it's a great learning school, and I, you know, I say, and a lot of times 
Most of the time, competition is the luck of the draw. Different week, different results. So you can't hang your entire self-worth on how did I do on this competition. Um, just think of the fact that, wow, I'm here. Uh, I'm going to play in a beautiful hall and a beautiful piano. Um, with the great music. With great music and just, and just focus on that. And you know, your, your performance is being broadcast all over the world. Um, you're being heard by so many thousands of people, not just here, but around the world. What great exposure. Absolutely. It seems that most of the major competitions now have live webcasts mm -hmm. with streaming picture. Do some of the com competitors get extra nervous about the fact that their performance, which is geared towards a particular room, is being streamed all over the world and perhaps in some cases archived? Yes, they do. They do. And I'm, I'm always there to say, look, um, if you're nervous about this aspect of it, um, we're happy to take it down after. We don't archive. If you don't want it archived, we won't. Because I, I know, being a performer myself, um, the internet is permanent. <laughs> and if you make it, you know, you have you crash and burn, you have a memory lapse or whatever happens, um, I wouldn't want that out there. These two winners, Alexander Schimpf and Stanislav Kristenko, mm -hmm. recent winners, what's special about these two artists? Oh my gosh, I could go on and on <laughs> about them. Um, and actually all of the, the Cleveland winners, um, that's what I love about this particular competition is they're all so incredibly different. And the one thing they all have in common, going all the way back to the Kasatsu years, is lyricism. They're all so focused on lyricism and poetry. And interestingly enough, when Paul Shaney, the artistic director, and I go to search for jurors. You know, we look for people that are also focused on that in their teaching and their philosophy. Um, we don't want louder, faster. Um, <laughs> you know, that typical competition, which is playing. the stereotype the about stereotype, competition exactly. playing. And uh, consistently, when they go to play at Carnegie Hall, the critics note that they say, "Wow, this is so uncompetition-like." This is, we, wouldn't, we would never expected this from a competition winner. Such thoughtful, thought-provoking, well put together programming, lyrical playing, um, and that's what I like. And you know, Alexander, first German to ever win uh, this competition. Um, I remember, you know, when he sat down. First of all, it looks like Beethoven when he sits down to play, and. And I remember at the competition when he um, started to play Schubert B-flat sonata, um, one of my favorite pieces. And I looked over at the jury and all of them put their notepads down and just sit, sat back and listened. And normally they're like scribbling away, but they listened for the entire piece. I didn't see anybody make any notes. And that, I thought, okay, he just, he just nailed this. Um, and because he owned it, it you know, it was, it wasn't, him playing this piece, it was sort of like Schubert coming alive through Alexander uh, because he has that Viennese background. It's just, it was wonderful. Um, and that's, that's been his whole focus is, you know, play, play what you're good at, play what, you, what you're best. Um, and then Stanislav arrives, you know, um, this whole Russian school and um, the the colors Stanislav gets out of the piano again that's another thing I'm I'm amazed you know he um, what he brought and not just the colors but he goes from one second to the other remember in his uh, second round or semi-final round he walked up you know I said hello you know have a wonderful time gave him a hug he walked out and you know took a bow and sat down and started to play Bartok Sonata and that really, I, I, could, I could hear the whole audience, <gasps> that intake of breath. Um, and that's what he goes after. Is he, he loves to feed off the energy of, of the audience. Um, and so everybody's different. That's what I love about the two of them. Yeah. So there's that point at which the contestant wins. Yeah. What has to happen after the Oh, win? a million things. <laughs> um, we have media interviews. Um, they have you know, interviews with WCLV, American Public Media. Uh, all the newspapers, um, newspapers from around the world, um, then, you know, f photographs, um, they go 
meeting with me, talk about the tour coming up. They have concerts starting. They meet their new manager. We work for the piano competition um, to get them their concerts. So it's um, then, you know, I said, then the hard work starts because then uh, this, this business of building the career of you, you yourself as a pianist and your own voice, then we start in all seriousness with that. The Cleveland competition winners obviously have an amazing opportunity with the win, mm -hmm. the tours, the recording contracts. Right. Is it possible to also build a successful career without a competition win? Of course, no doubt. Um, look at some of the world's most phenomenal um, pianists out there. Um, I think of what Andras Schiff. Andras Schiff. You know, um, never did a competition. Uh, Rubenstein never did a competition. Um, of course, it is possible, um, but it's a different kind of competition, right? As I said earlier, everything is a competition, um, and also sometimes it's luck of the draw. I mean, if you look at some of how somebody's career is sometimes made, filling in at the last moment for a big name that had to drop out of a concert due to illness, you know, they're lucky that they got the call, and of course they have to step up and do their thing. Um, but I think there's oftentimes just this, it, it, it's just um, mysterious cocktail of ingredients that go into making a career. Um, but yes, you can do it yourself. And I, I've often talked at you know, conservatories and universities about how to go about building a career, you know, apart from piano competitions and also, you know, preparing for a competition. You can use all of that to transfer into other parts of building this career because you have to build a resume. You have to go for a photo shoot. You know, um, I would say, to please, if you're applying to the piano competition, especially the Cleveland, it's sort of like a job interview. Do not submit a selfie <laughs> for it, your photograph. You know, go and do a professional headshot. Um, I, as a, you know, the, the head of the competition, I want to look at your entire profile. Are you ready to take to be, on, you know, on the cusp of a career? Are you ready to take on this career? So, do you have a website? Have you done any, you know, peer-reviewed uh, performances? Have you played with orchestra? What's your concerto repertoire look like? Um, you know, so I say to everybody, you know, just get out of the practice room and go perform, go play, even if you have to organize the concert yourself at first, and just get out there, do it. Um, pretty soon one thing will lead to another um, and that's just how it all starts you know but you don't need a competition a competition gives you that little boost that maybe saves you three or four years of work <laughs> but you can still get there I mean definitely competitions often have the reputation of fostering controversy mm -hmm. and being political what can be done to avoid this type of atmosphere yeah uh, controversy is almost sort of part and parcel sometimes of this world of piano competitions, but we're, I'm very careful at the Cleveland competition, first of all, in the jury that we choose. I remember, um, for example, I asked Sergei Papayan um, if he would be on the jury, and he said, sure, but one thing, if I'm on the jury and one of my students get in, I will withdraw. And I love that. I said, okay, absolutely. I encourage that. That's great. Um, whereas maybe other competitions, I don't know. Yes. Wouldn't maybe be as open to that. Um, and he did with the Tchaikovsky, for example, when Daniela entered Sergei withdrew. Um, and the way we score, um, I've sat on juries also, won't name names, but I've sat on juries where people talk in the jury room. They discuss the contestants. And some, some people think that's healthy. <laughs> I can say that uh, no, when it gets into a screaming match, then it's not healthy anymore. Um, and sometimes, you know, an older juror with more experience or maybe more clout in the music industry will be more convincing um, to a younger juror um, that has an equal voice, a very valid musical equal voice. And so there's no discussion in our jury room at all. <laughs> and I'm with the jury. 100% of the time, always, to make sure that there's no discussion. Um, right up until you know, 10, 11 at night when they go to their rooms and say goodnight, I'm there. Um, we have dinner together. I make sure that there's no discussion. And um, then the, the voting, the way we do the voting, the scoring, 
Um, it's all very transparent. There's one to 25. We have an outside statistician that comes in. Um, I take the scores to that person. He tabulates everything. Um, and it's just, it's all very transparent. We make sure um, that nobody can, there's no rigging, nobody can influence that. And if you, if you have a, a juror that, for example, consistently scores high or low to say yes and no, the, the way the program works will just throw that out. It will squeeze it all. I'm not sure exactly how the math works, but it squeezes them all to the middle. Um, so we try to take care of it that way. And finally, Pierre, you're so young, you're so successful, you're a beloved member of the community. Recently, you received the 40 Under 40 mm -hmm. prize from the Cleveland business community. What is your winning formula for success? Oh my gosh. Um, I just think focus on what you're doing right now. You know, you have a task at hand, and I just keep your head down and do your thing, um, especially with the piano competition. And I think as a training as a musician, you know, what, music is one of the few industries where you're, as a musician, faced with your own iniquities day to day. You're looking in the mirror at, you know, trying to better yourself with one passage day to day. I remember spending an entire semester when I was a master's student on one Chopin ballade, um, un uncovering ev every nook and cranny. And I think that's spilled over into my philosophy in business is I am not afraid of exposing every single weakness that I have and that the competition has. And let's address it. Um, let's see what we can do about it um, and try not to you know, cover it up because it's that it won't work. You know, when you go up on stage, the one thing that you covered up will bite you in the butt, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of my whole philosophy about it. Pierre, thank you so much for your time and for being here on Living the Classical Life. It was such a pleasure. Thank you. So thank you so much. Awesome. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> <laughs>